Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called Trigonometric Functions of Acute Angles. This is part one. Really complicated sounding title, but I promise I'll break it down for you so it will be very easy to understand. So we have to introduce all of the trigonometric functions all together. In the last couple of lessons, we have already introduced sine and we've already introduced cosine and we've done a ton of discussion about what those actually mean. So now we have to really take sine and cosine and extend those ideas to the other four trig functions because really there are six trig functions in all. But the good news is you don't have to memorize too many things because really the fundamental trig functions are the sine and the cosine functions. Everything else, all of these other trig functions come from sine and cosine. So verbally, I'll just go through it with you uh, here before we write anything down. We have sine, we have cosine, we also have tangent. Then we have to define something called cotangent, then secant, and then cosecant. So sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. So that's six altogether. But as I said, the fundamental ones really are just sine and cosine. All of the other ones come from sine and cosine. So I'm gonna write a ton of stuff down and it's going to look intimidating. But in the back of your mind, I really need you to understand that really all that's important, or the most important, is sine and cosine. That's why I spent entire lessons on them just a minute ago. Everything else comes from that, okay? So these are trigonometric functions of acute angles. That just means acute angles are angles less than 90 degrees. And so that's how we're gonna start the discussion. So at first we're gonna start learning about these trig functions of acute angles, which are just angles smaller than 90 degrees. But just realize in the back of your mind that as we go through the lessons, we'll be extending it to what happens when the angle is larger than 90 degrees. All these crazy large angles we already introduced, we're going to know and have to learn how to take trig functions, sines and cosines and tangents and so on of all of those angles too. But we have to crawl before we walk, so we're gonna talk about acute angles. All right, so what I'm gonna do is draw a triangle on the board and I'm gonna write all the trig functions down and then we're going to talk about them and you should understand exactly where they come from by the end of this. So everything boils down to what a triangle is. So we're gonna draw a right triangle. When I say uh, triangles, uh, everything boils down to triangles, I mean right triangles, okay? So what I'm going to do is draw a little triangle there and then we need to kind of superimpose the triangle on an x, y axis. So the y axis uh, is going to, that's a terrible y axis. Let me see if I can clean that up a little bit. The y axis is going to be going straight up and down, a little better, not too much. Uh, and then the x axis is gonna be going across like that. So this is the x axis. You all know this is always the y axis. And there is some angle, this, uh, this ray right here uh, is some, at some angle theta to the x-axis. Remember, all angles are measured with respect to the positive x-axis. So this is just the angle measure right there. Now the tip of this ray right here, there forms some point right at the end here. And so this point has some x and y coordinate over here. I don't know what they are, it doesn't matter, but every point in the x-y plane has an x-y coordinate. So we're just saying there's a, a point right there at the end, we call it p, it has some coordinates x and y, and when you connect this point to the origin, there forms some angle theta right here. All right, now we have to talk about this triangle, which is the black thing. Now remember, this is a right triangle because we have a right angle right here. All right, so what we need to do is label a few things. Now, the hypotenuse of the triangle is always opposite from the right angle. So we're gonna call this HYP. That means hypotenuse, right? But also, we're going to label it uh, in a different way as well. So I'm gonna do a little curly brace like this and tell you that this length right here, we're gonna call it R. You, in different books, might see different letters. It doesn't matter what your book has or exactly the notation. All I'm trying to tell you is every triangle that's right has a hypotenuse and the uh, hypotenuse, sometimes you call it C for Pythagorean theorem. We're just gonna call it R here. So that's what we're doing. And uh, so we have a hypotenuse here. Now this angle has a side of the triangle that is opposite to it, that's this side, and an adjacent side of the triangle here. So this side is what we call the opposite side. OPP means opposite. And this side of the triangle is called the adjacent side. So when you look at an angle, you need to kind of figure out where the hypotenuse is. And when you go down to the, to the side closest, nearest this angle here, that's called the adjacent side. And the side opposite to that angle is called the uh, opposite side, okay? So the opposite side is uh, basically, if you think about it, the opposite side of this triangle goes from this point P down to the axis right here. So really, if I kind of get my curly brace in here like this, something like this, this distance is Y units above the axis like this. 
And then this distance right here, this distance is x. The reason I'm drawing all this stuff is because usually when you first learn trig functions, you talk about opposite and adjacent sides. And that's handy for a bit, but you eventually drop that and you don't talk about opposite and adjacent uh, when we get a little farther into the class here. We talk about the x side and the y side and all of this. So I'm drawing everything on one figure. I'm saying, hey, every triangle has a hypotenuse. We also call it r. Every triangle has an opposite side. We also call it y. The reason we call it y is because there's y distance units from here to the tip of this triangle. Okay. Every triangle also has an adjacent side adjacent to this angle. We also call this side x because it is x distance units from here to here. So x, y, and r. So that's what we're basically doing. All right. Now what we're going to do is use this triangle to define the six trigonometric functions. And then I'm going to show you a quick way to understand how to remember them all. So I really only need you to understand sine and cosine. Uh, honestly, the rest will just fall out of the discussion. And then we'll solve, of course, some problems toward the end and a bunch of problems as we go through the lessons here to make sure you're comfortable with it. All right, so the first trig function that we must, must, must understand, we've already introduced it in the last lesson. It is called sine of this angle theta. So sine of this angle theta is defined to be the opposite side of this triangle divided by the hypotenuse of the triangle. So it's the opposite side over hypotenuse. In every textbook that you open, whether it's geometry or algebra or calculus or pre-calculus or trig or whatever, you'll always see a triangle and it'll have an opposite side and an adjacent side and you'll see that the sine function is defined to be the opposite side of the triangle divided by the hypotenuse. That means if I actually measure, if I took a ruler and measured this length and then measured this length and divided them, that would be what we call sine of this angle. Now because the opposite side is also called y, we can put a y up here, and the hypotenuse is also called r, we can put an r down here. So the sine of the angle is y over r. It's just the opposite over the adjacent side, right? Now the cosine we also introduced in the last lesson, and that was defined to be the adjacent side of the triangle divided by the hypotenuse. So if you take this side of the triangle, measure it in however many centimeters it is, and divide by this, then what you'll get is the, what we call the cosine. Now since the adjacent uh, is the x uh, variable, or the x label, we can say this is x over r. So you see we use this opposite adjacent hypotenuse business at first, but eventually we're going to drop all that and we're just going to start talking about x's and y's and r's. So in your mind you need to have this triangle burned in so you know what, what that actually is, and that's why I'm drawing it here. Now in the last lesson we spent a tremendous amount of time talking about what sine and cosine really mean. If you haven't watched that lesson, I actually really, really hope you pause this, go watch it first. But I'm going to summarize what we did in about 30 minutes in the previous lesson. It took 30 minutes to go over it in great detail. And I'm going to summarize it in the following way. When you see sine of an angle, what you really are talking about is it is the ratio. It is the ratio of how much this triangle goes up compared to, that means division, compared to how much total length of the hypotenuse of the triangle there is. And I told you in the last lesson that we called this the chop factor for y. The reason we call it the chop factor, and that's my word, that's not a word that you're going to, to you know, see in a book anywhere, is because it is literally a decimal that comes out. It's a number less than one. When you take y and divide by r, you get a number less than one. And it tells you in a number form how much of this triangle is going up in the y direction compared to the total length of the triangle, which is the hypotenuse. So if the chop factor for y is very big, then that means that this y, is, this triangle is really tall and most of the triangle is going up, okay? But if you have, I'm going to get to it in a second, but the chop factor in the x direction, if you have a large chop factor in the x direction, it means that most of the triangle is actually going along the x direction. So these chop factors are my words, but sine basically tells you how much of the triangle is going in the vertical direction, in the y direction. Is it a really tall triangle in the y direction? And if, it, if you have a, a, a very small chop factor in the y direction, it means that that's not the case. And the similar thing for here. So we said in the last lesson that this cosine is the chop factor for the x direction, right? Because we learned in the last lesson that if we know what the sine and the cosine is of an angle, and there's a button on your calculator, we're going to learn how to use it later, but if you know what the sine and cosine of an, of, a, of an angle is, then you know what these chop factors are. Sine goes with y, it is the chop factor in the y direction, and 
cosine goes with x. That's the chop factor in the x direction. And so if you know what these chop factors are, then I can take the chop factor and multiply by the hypotenuse, and that will tell me how many units my triangle is in the y direction if I'm multiplying by this one. And if I multiply by this one, it's telling me how many units it is in the x direction. In other words, if I know that my triangle has a hypotenuse of 10 meters, if I multiply by the, the, the sine, which is the chop in the y direction, then I'm going to get this side of the triangle. Because look, it's opposite over hypotenuse. If I then multiply by the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse will cancel and I'll be left with the opposite side. That's why it's called the chop, because you, when you multiply by the hypotenuse, if you multiply the sine of the angle times the hypotenuse, it cuts the hypotenuse down and only tells you how much of it goes in the vertical direction. If you take the chop in the x direction and multiply by the hypotenuse, then what you're understanding as the answer is it's chopping down that hypotenuse and telling you how much of this hypotenuse exists in the x direction. So I call it chop in x and chop in y, because when I multiply those factors times the hypotenuse, if I multiply the hypotenuse times the sine, it gives me the length of the opposite side. If I multiply the length of the hypotenuse times the cosine of this angle, it gives me the length of the adjacent side. And that we're going to learn through solving many, many problems. That's why I call it the chop factor. Another way you can look at it is it's a projection. If I shine a light in this direction, the shadow that the hypotenuse creates over here in, against a screen, if I put a screen here, would be the length of this triangle. So the sine of the angle is basically telling you, since it's a ratio of y to hypotenuse, it's telling you how much of, a, of, the, of that shadow is going to exist over here. And so it's kind of a projection of that hypotenuse onto a screen over there in the y direction. Or if I put a light vertically underneath like this, it would cast a shadow down there. So the sine is kind of a projection in the y direction of the hypotenuse. And the cosine is the projection of the hypotenuse in the x direction. So whether you think chop in x and chop in y, or projection in x, projection in y, it's all the same thing. The sine goes with the y direction. The cosine always goes with the x direction, and that is something you must remember. All right, so now that we know what sine and cosine are, and we've kind of revisited what we already learned in the past, we need to talk about the tangent function. So the tangent of some angle theta is defined as follows. The opposite side divided by the adjacent side. So the opposite side divided by the adjacent side, like this. So the opposite side is y, and the adjacent side is x. So if I put it in that notation, it will be y over x. Now, we said that the sine is the ratio of how much the triangle goes up compared to its total length. So it's telling you what fraction of the triangle is going in the vertical direction. The cosine is the, is the division of x to r, so it's telling you how much of the triangle is going in the horizontal direction. That's why the chopping and the projections come into play. But the tangent doesn't involve the hypotenuse at all. It's just the y direction divided by the x direction. y divided by x. y divided by x. So what does that remind you of? That should be reminding you of the slope of a line. Rise over run. Remember, we learned with a line, any line, if you go and look at how many units it goes up, that's the rise. How many units it goes over, that's called the run. The rise is always in the y direction. The run is always in the x direction. So when you calculate slope of a line a long time ago, you were always taking how high it goes in y and dividing by how high it go, over it goes in x. y over x. All this is doing is the rise is how many y units is up and the run is how many x units over. So when you take y divided by x, or opposite over adjacent, the thing that we're calling the tangent of this um, angle is really uh, rise over run. So this is really rise over run. Uh, and it, basically, that's going to equal to the slope um, of the hypotenuse r, because the hypotenuse is kind of the line r we're talking right here. So if you were to draw this, if you calculate y over x, you're calculating the slope of this triangle, of this hypotenuse line. That's not something you often see in books, but that's all the tangent is doing. It is the ratio of y to x, which basically means the slope of that line. Okay. Now, now we get into um, a little bit of, of, of a sticky territory, because sine cosine, we understand, tangent is just y divided by x, so it's just the sides of the triangle. And I can explain it to you as the slope of a line. Those kind of make sense. But then we get into the next three, cotangent, secant, cosecant. And then you're kind of like your brain falls apart usually the first time because it doesn't 
um, seem to make a lot of sense. Why do we need three extra functions, okay? I'm gonna get into the why we need three extra functions a little bit later, but for now, let me write down exactly what they are. So we have this thing called a tangent. We also have something closely related called the cotangent. C-O-T means cotangent of theta. Cotangent is defined to be one over the tangent of theta. So literally, if I take a triangle like this and I calculate y over x and I get the tangent, I know what the tangent is. Let's say the tangent is three, okay, or something like this. If I take one over three, which I know what the tangent is, if I stick it in there and say, well, one over that, that's what the cotangent is. So you see the cotangent comes directly from the tangent. It comes directly from the tangent. And the tangent is just involving y and x. So really when I told you the most fundamental things are sine and cosine, that was absolutely true. Sine and cosine are most fundamental. Tangent can come from sine and cosine and cotangent comes from the tangent. So you see, that's how we remember these things. So one over the tangent there. Now, what is tangent equal to? It's equal to y over x. So if you think about it, one over y over x, if you were to actually flip and multiply, what you would get is x over y. So x over y is cotangent because it's equal to the one over the tangent, right? And we call this cotangent like this. All right, there's two more. There's one more called the secant. We call it SEC of theta. And what is the secant equal to? Well, if the cotangent was one over the tangent, the secant is one over the cosine of theta. So you see, once you know what the cosine is, you take one over that number and you get something that we call the secant, right? But since when we go up to the cosine, the cosine was adjacent over hypotenuse. So if we do one over this, this is gonna get flipped over. So it's gonna be the hypotenuse over the adjacent side. So again, x over r, if we would do one over that and flip it over, it would be r over x. Now, a lot of students try to remember these things. Oh, the secant of theta is hypotenuse over adjacent. It's r over x. It's so confusing. You don't need to remember any of that. All you need to remember is the first two of these things, because if I tell you the secant is one over the cosine, then you already have remembered what the cosine is. You don't have to remember anything new. It's just one over that, okay? And this thing is called the secant, like this, okay? The last one I wanna write down is called the cosecant, which is CSC of theta. CSC means cosecant. And you might guess if this was one over tangent, this is one over cosine, then the cosecant is one over the sine of theta, like this, one over the sine. And since the sine of theta was opposite over hypotenuse, which is y over x, if you do one over those things, then what you get is the hypotenuse over the opposite side, just divide those, exactly the same thing as r over y. So do one over this means you flip it over, one over this means you flip it over, right? And how do you spell it? You spell it as cosecant. All right, cosecant. Now before I go any farther, I wanna tell you an easy way to remember all these and how they're related to one another. The most fundamental, one, uh, the most fundamental uh, equations here are sine and cosine. Those are the most fundamental ones that we have to learn, uh, and, and we, that's, we, I divided, devoted an entire lesson to it. All right, so the way you need to remember these things, I want you to remember them in this sequence. Sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. Say it one more time. Sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. Remember them in that order. This is the reason why. Because if I write them down, then what I'll have is sine, then cosine, then tangent, then cotangent, because that comes right after the tangent, then secant, then cosecant. I want you to remember this, uh, this, uh, this order because here is the reason why. When you write them down in this order, I can draw like a little rainbow kind of thing. Connect the tangent to the, co to the cotangent, connect the cosine to the secant, connect the sine to the cosecant, like this. I, you, I call it the trig you know, rainbow if you want to. And what that tells me, what it tells us, I'm gonna draw a little dividing line so I don't get in the way here. Without memorizing this entire thing, what it tells me is that the cotangent is one over the tangent. Cotangent is one over tangent. It tells me that the secant is one over the, the cosine. Okay, and by the way, when I say cotangent, I mean cotangent of some angle. Secant of some angle. Cosine of some angle, okay? And then cosecant, what do you think that's gonna be equal to? Cosecant of some angle is one over sine 
of the same exact angle. So cosecant is one over sine, secant is one over cosine, cotangent is one over tangent. These are your very first introduction to trig identities. I don't really like introducing them so early, but we have to introduce them early. Otherwise, students are gonna try to memorize this chart. And I think it's a tremendous waste of time to memorize that chart. You don't need to memorize the chart. I'm just putting it here because you're gonna see it in your book. And I want you to know that I'm covering everything, but you don't need to re remember that the cotangent is x over y. You do not need to remember that the secant is r over x. You don't need to remember that the cosecant is r over y. You don't need to remember any of that. All I really want you to remember at most is the first three. Sine is y over r, opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is x over r, which is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Tangent is the slope of the line. You can remember that because it's the slope. Y over x or opposite over adjacent. But all of these other ones is just one over tangent, one over cosine, one over sine. A lot of students try to memorize these, but you don't need to remember it because if you just put it down in the correct order, then you have always, you remember exactly, you can draw it and you can see. Cotangent's one over tangent. Secant's one over cosine. Cosecant is one over sine. All right, a couple of notes I wanna go through. We said that sine is the chop factor for y, which means the projection of this hypotenuse in the y direction. Cosine is the chop factor for x. Another way to think of it is the projection of the hypotenuse in the x direction. Tangent means rise over run, which is the slope of this uh, hypotenuse of this triangle. Um, cotangent is uh, one over the tangent. It's literally the opposite of the slope calculation, just defined differently as run over rise. That's all it means. And then when you look at secant and realize that it's r over x, all it's telling you, instead of, instead of x over r being the ratio of the x direction to the hypotenuse, the secant here is r over x. When you take the hypotenuse, which is a bigger number, and you divide by x, it's just telling you how many x parts, how many adjacent sides of the triangle fit into the hypotenuse. That is what a secant is. It's basically telling me, I'm gonna take the hypotenuse r and I'm gonna divide by x. How many x directions, how many of these adjacent sides fit in there? Is it 1.2, because this is longer. Is it like 1.2 um, uh, of these uh, lengths of this triangle can fit? or more or less, right? And when you have the cosecant, it's just the hypotenuse divided by the y direction. How many of these y distances can fit in one of those uh, hypotenuses? So the secant and the cosecant are just flipped upside down sines and cosines, which means they're telling you how many of those adjacent and opposite sides fit into, in terms of division, fit into the hypotenuse. But the, the deeper reason or the deeper understanding is why do we even need cotangent, secant, and cosecant? The real reason we have them defined is because when you get farther down the road, you're gonna be writing equations, lots of equations, that involve sines and cosines. I mean, they pop up everywhere. In every branch of science, math, engineering, physics, chemistry, I can go on and on. Every branch, they pop up everywhere. So what happens if you have the sign in the denominator of a fraction? Well, you could leave the sign in the denominator of a fraction. What if you have a cosine function in the denominator on the bottom of a fraction. Like you just manipulate some equation, you get it on the bottom there. What, what do you do? Well, you could leave it there, but you, then you could also, if you want to take, take a little uh, a shortcut here, call it, if the cosine's in the bottom, we'll just write the whole thing in terms of a secant function. If the sine ends up in the bottom of some fraction somewhere, instead of leaving that ugly fraction there, we'll just write it as a cosecant. So the reason we have the cotangents and the cosecants and the secants is really because sometimes those trig functions end up on the bottom of fractions when you solve equations later. And instead of leaving it like that, we have different names so we can get rid of all the fractions and call them secants and cosecants. That's why I'm trying to harp on the idea that cosecants and secants and cotangents are not that important. They come from everything above. All right, now that we have introduced what these are, we've done tons of talking, we need to solve some problems. We're gonna solve a couple problems here, and then over the next several lessons, we're gonna be solving ton, so many problems like this that you're gonna get bored doing them, but I really want you to do all of them, because this stuff does not come naturally to most people. You have to work a ton of problems, and that's what we're gonna do. So let's go ahead and start and solve our very first problem. All right. The problem is very simple. I'm going to give you a triangle and you, I want you to calculate the six trigonometric functions. If you ever see a problem that says find the six trig functions, what they want is, here we go, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. I want you to do them in that order because if you remember that order, then you'll automatically remember these identities down here without having to memorize anything. So what do we do? The first problem goes like this. Here's a triangle. 
We're gonna get very, very, very comfortable with drawing triangles in this class. There's some angle theta right here, which I kind of botched, sorry about that. Some angle theta right here. This side has a length of eight and this side has a length of six. And the question is, I want you to write all six trigonometric functions of the angle theta in this drawing here. How do we do that? Well, we know from experience that sine is going to be opposite over hypotenuse and cosine is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. But in our drawing, we were not given the hypotenuse. So a lot of students would look at that and say, well, how do I do it? I don't have the hypotenuse. But all of these are right triangles. So the Pythagorean theorem always applies. So if you don't have the hypotenuse, you have to figure it out yourself. C squared is A squared plus B squared. Now, I'm calling the C. I know over there I called it R. I mean, you have, you have to work with me here. It's so the Pythagorean theorem is always written like this. So we say C squared is, here we go with 6 squared, this side squared, plus 8 squared. So C squared, when you do 6 times 6 is 36, and then 8 times 8 is 64, and add them together, you're going to get 100. And so the, the distance there, you take the square root of both sides, you get 10. That means that the length of this hypotenuse of the triangle is actually 10. We know that that's true because we can always use the Pythagorean theorem to find the lengths of the other sides of a right triangle. Now we have to find the six trig functions. Here we go. The sine of the angle is the opposite side of this angle over the hypotenuse. Okay, the opposite side is in the y direction, of course, right, because it's y, and the value of it over there is 6, divided by the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is 10. So the answer is 6 over 10. But that's a fraction, so what we can really say is that the sine of the angle, and we divide here by 2, and we divide by 2, 6 divided by 2 is 3, 10 divided by 2 is 5, so we get 3 fifths. So the sine of this angle is 3 fifths. What is it telling me? It's telling me that the ratio of how tall the triangle is in the y direction compared to the length of the hypotenuse is 3 tenths. In other words, it doesn't go up very high compared to the length of the hypotenuse because it's a pretty small, it's, well, it's, I guess it's, a, it's more than half. Three, I said 3 tenths, I'm sorry, 3 fifths. So it's a little bit more than half. So when you look at this triangle, you can see, and probably I didn't draw it exactly right, but the ratio of this is divided by this is a little bit more than uh, half. In other words, this thing is shorter than this by about a half, a little bit more than a half. All right, now let's go ahead and calculate the next one. So we have cotangent, I'm sorry, cosine. Cosine of the angle is the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse, right? Adjacent is x, and which means the x direction here is 8 units over there, and then divide by the same 10. You're always comparing to the hypotenuse, so 8 over 10. And so what you get is the cosine of the angle. We can divide by 2 and divide by 2, so what we'll get is 4 fifths. So the cosine of the angle is 4 fifths. That's the second trig function. What does this actually mean? It means that the triangle stretches in the x direction 4 units for, as, well I shouldn't say 4 units, I should say that compared to the hypotenuse, the ratio of the x to the hypotenuse uh, side is 4 fifths, much, much higher than before. So compared to the hypotenuse, the triangle stretches more in the x direction compared to hypotenuse because this is a closer, a number closer to one um, as compared to the, to the sine. All right, now let's go back and calculate the tangent uh, of the angle. And let me go back and say that this sine and this cosine, these are the chopping factors, another way to say it. Um, the, in the, uh, in the, remember sine goes with y and cosine goes with x. So the chopping factor in the y direction is 3 fifths and the chopping factor in the x direction is four-fifths, and that means when we take those chopping factors and multiply by the hypotenuse, they tell us the other sides of the triangle. We're gonna do a lot more practice with that in just a minute. All right, so the tangent of this angle is going to be equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side, which is y over x, which is, what is it equal to here? Six over eight. So the opposite side is six and then eight. So six for the y direction, eight for the x direction. So the tangent, when you divide by two, you're going to get three fourths. Let me just check myself, three fourths. What is this telling me? The tangent, remember, is really just another way of telling me rise over run of that triangle hypotenuse. It's the slope of the hypotenuse. So this fraction is literally rise over run. How much does the hypotenuse go up compared to how much does it go over? That's what it's telling me. And then I have to do uh, and ask myself, we've done sine, cosine, tangent. Now I have to do cotangent, secant, and cosecant.
right? Cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Maybe I should go look at that chart. No, you don't need to go look at that chart. Just write it down. We say sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. And this one goes with this one, and this one goes with this one, and this one goes with this one. Now you have everything uh, already in place. You don't have to remember anything else. We now know that the cotangent of an angle is one over the tangent of the angle. But the tangent of the angle, we already know what that is. It's 3 fourths. So we put it down here, it's 3 fourths. Which means the numerator is 1 over 1. Change this division to multiplication, flip the fraction over, and then the cotangent of the angle is 4 thirds. I told you the cotangent is like a flipped over version of the slope. It's run over rise. This one's rise over run, this one's run over rise. That's how it's defined. That's what you have to kind of work with, because that's what it is. All right, so now we have the cotangent. Let's go find what the secant of this angle is. We don't need to memorize or look at that. We say, well, the secant is the one over the cosine. And that means one over the cosine. Cosine's four-fifths, which means it's going to flip over. And so the secant is going to be five-fourths. Hypotenuse divided by um, the other side of the triangle there, the, uh, the uh, x direction there. Okay? And then we have cosecant. Cosecant, theta, is 1 over, what is it? I forget. Well, let me go over here. Of course, I need to write it correctly. Cosecant, 1 over sine. What did I already calculate for sine? It's 3 fifths. So it's going to be 1 over 3 fifths which means the cosecant of this angle is 5 thirds. 5 thirds. And the cotangent, let me just double check myself, the cotangent's 4 thirds, the secant's 5 fourths, and the cosecant is 5 thirds. So if you're ever given a problem that says find the six trigonometric functions, you're always gonna do the same thing. You're gonna write the triangle, you have to know what the hypotenuse is and the other sides of the triangle to find sine and cosine. Tangent is basically the slope, rise over run, y over x, and then the remaining three come from this trig rainbow. The cotangent is one over the tangent, the secant is one over the cosine, and the cosecant is one over the sine. Now, and this is it. You would circle all of these and say these are the six trig functions. But I want to go a touch deeper because I spent so much time in the last lesson talking about what the meaning of sine and cosine is. So now we know what the six trig functions are for this triangle. We also know what the three sides of the triangle are. And so we can do a little bit of checking. You know, when you do a basic division for the first time, you learn how to divide. And then you're always taught to check yourself by like multiplying, to go backwards and multiply and figure out and make sure that you got the right answer. You know, when you do an equation, you're always taught, you get the answer for x and you plug it back in and see if you're correct. So now we have calculated the six trig ratios and we can use some of them to check and make sure that our calculations were right. Remember, how we're going to check here is the following thing. The sine function is the chopping function in the y direction. It takes the hypotenuse that you have and it chops it so that it, I, I don't have 10 anymore. It chops it down and it should give me six in this direction. The Cosine is the chopping factor for the x direction. I should be able to take this hypotenuse and chop it down so it should give me the 8 back. How do I check and see if this is actually happening? Right? So for the x direction, what I'm basically saying is the following. If I take the hypotenuse and I multiply by the cosine of the angle, it's the hypotenuse times the chopping factor in the x direction. Then what I'm going to get, the hypotenuse was 10. What is the cosine? Go over here. The cosine is 4 fifths. So when I multiply this, what do I get? Multiply the tops, I get 40. Multiply the bottom, 5 times 1 is 5. And what do I get? 40 divided by 5, that's 8. So you see what's happening. The x direction, when I take the hypotenuse and I chop it in the x direction, I get an answer of 8, which is exactly what my triangle is. The cosine function, when you multiply it times the hypotenuse, chops it down and it kind of cuts it so that it gives you the x portion of that triangle, the, uh, the, the portion that lies along the x-axis that chops it in the x-direction. What do you think is going to happen um, when we do the exact same thing for the y-direction? If I take the hypotenuse and I multiply by the sine of the angle, it means I'm multiplying by the chopping factor in the y-direction. The hypotenuse never changed. It's still 10, but the sine is the chopping factor in the y-direction. It was 3 fifths. So multiply by 3 fifths, what do I get? Right? I'm going to get on the top 30, 
on the bottom five, and I divide those and I get six. So when I take the hypotenuse and I'm multiplying by the chopping factor in the uh, y direction, I get an answer of six, which is the side of the triangle here. So when you take any hypotenuse and multiply by the sine of the angle, it takes the hypotenuse and it chops it and gives you this side of the triangle. When you take the, the hypotenuse and you multiply by the cosine of the angle, it chops it down and it gives you this side of the triangle. And that is why since the very beginning, I've been telling you about this whole chopping thing because it comes up over and over again. You can use it to check your triangles uh, as you go along throughout these basic problems. We also use it extensively later in something called vectors. We're gonna learn about vectors later in this class. And then when you go on into math and engineering, you can't get away from vectors. We use them from everything, from space probes, to building bridges, to building electronics. I mean, everything uses a vector. And so the idea of taking a hypotenuse and chopping it in the x direction, chopping it in the y direction, that is critically important to understanding this thing called a vector later. So I'm kind of teaching you some of that as we go in the beginning because it is very important. All right? Now, why does this chopping thing work? Well, it's because the sine is defined to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. So of course, if I multiply this by the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse will cancel and I'll be left with the opposite side. That's exactly what I was left with. If I take a cosine, it's defined to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. If I multiply this by a hypotenuse, this is a chopping factor multiplied by the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse is cancel and I'm left with the adjacent side, which is exactly what the eight was, the adjacent side of this triangle. So we've learned a lot in this lesson. We have introduced the concept of, of a reference triangle like that. We have an adjacent side, an opposite side, which are X and Y directions. We have the hypotenuse, we call that R. And the tippy uh, point at the tippy end over here called P has some X, Y coordinates because it's X units this way, Y units up. The sine is opposite over hypotenuse, Y over X. The cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, uh, X over R. I may have misspoke, uh, Y over R and then X over R divided by the hypotenuse. These are the chopping factors in the X direction and the Y direction, just like we talked about. The tangent function is y over x. It's rise over run. It's the slope of this line right here. These are kind of the most fundamental ones. Really, sine and cosine are even more fundamental, but they're all pretty fundamental. These down here come literally just come from doing one over these other three trig functions. So I do not want you to memorize these. Do not memorize these. Just remember sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. Then you can remember all of these identities, and we will use them so much throughout the class that uh, you know, you'll get, you'll get to eventually remember them anyway. So make sure you understand this. Follow me on to the next lesson after you have solved these problems that we have put on the board. Follow me on to the next lesson. We're gonna get a lot more practice with calculating these six trigonometric functions.